morning. Thank you for joining us for uh, this uh, lesson that we're going to study, lesson number 40 in the parable series. Uh, if you remember, in the syllabus, we have 51 lessons. And uh, these lessons deal with analogies and miracles and parables of Jesus that teach deep spiritual truth. Before we begin our study of lesson number 40, we want to ask for the Lord's presence. So I invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being here today. We ask that your holy word will teach us important lessons for our spiritual life. Help us, Lord, to open our hearts and minds so that we can receive the seed of truth. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, let's go to the introduction of our lesson. This lesson primarily deals with the story of the man who was born blind. The story is found in John chapter 9. Let's go to the introduction. The central focus of our lesson today will be the healing of the man who was born blind. As with so many other miracles of Jesus, we will find in our lesson that this miracle was not centered so much in the healing of physical blindness, but actually was dealing with spiritual blindness. In actual fact, Jesus used this miracle of healing the man who was born blind as a springboard to teach profound lessons about the loss and recovery of spiritual eyesight. So let's jump right into our study by taking a look at the historical setting of this miracle that was performed by Jesus. The historical occasion. Number one, where had Jesus been before he healed the man who was born blind from birth? Where had Jesus been? The answer is in John chapter 8 and verse 2. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. So you notice clearly here that right before this miracle, Jesus had entered the temple and was teaching the, to the, teaching the people in the temple. Let's go to number two. What profound words had Jesus spoken while he was yet in the temple? Well, in John chapter 8 and verse 12, Jesus had spoken some revolutionary words. This is what uh, John 8 verse 12 says. And Jesus is speaking. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So you notice here that Jesus is saying that he is the light of the world. And of course, light dispels the darkness. People who are in the dark can't see. Basically, they're walking around blind. Let's go to question number three. What did the Jews attempt to do with Jesus immediately before he healed the blind man. Remember that in John chapter 8, everything is revolving around light and darkness. And Jesus has said, you know, if you receive me, you'll be free indeed. And, uh, you know, the devil is a liar from the beginning. And he even said to them, you are children of the devil. And so there's this dialogue going on in John chapter 8. And Jesus is identifying himself, uh, di identifying himself as the Messiah, as the light of the world. So uh, we notice here, uh, what did Jesus attempt to, uh, the Jews, excuse me, attempt to do with Jesus immediately before he healed the blind man? Well, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. And uh, we find in John chapter 8 and verse 59, Then they took up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So Jesus identified himself clearly as the I am of the burning bush, obviously the promised Messiah, and they rejected him. They took up stones to stone him. Let's go to question number four at the bottom of page 295. What words of Jesus particularly incense the Jews who heard him? This uh, is the verse that I mentioned previously. Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. So Jesus was not only identifying himself as the Messiah, 
He was identifying himself as the I am who appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Let's go to the top of page 296. Where was Jesus when he healed the blind man? We find in John chapter 9 and verse 1, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. Now, the text doesn't tell us exactly where Jesus was, but in the previous chapter, Jesus has been teaching in the temple. And uh, so we would, uh, I think, be correct in assuming that Jesus was still here in the context of the temple. Let's read the note. Acts 3 verses 1 and 2 explains that people who were ill customarily waited at the entrance to the temple to beg for alms. Uh, you know, you can also look at John chapter 9 and verse 8. This would seem to indicate that the blind man was at the entrance to the temple when Jesus healed him. Now, we've noticed the historical setting of this particular teaching of Jesus, uh, this particular miracle of Jesus, which also teaches deep spiritual truth. So now let's talk about the origin and reason for the disease of this man who was born blind. Let's go to question number one. This is page 296 at the top of the page. What mistaken notion did the disciples have concerning the origin of this man's disease? How did uh, the disciples see the disease of this man, the reason for the disease? The answer is in John chapter 9 and verse 2. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin? this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Let's read the note. This is uh, Desire of Ages, page 471. It was genu generally believed by the Jews that sin is punished in this life. Satan, the author of sin and all its results, had led men to look upon disease and death as proceeding from God as punishment arbitrarily inflicted on account of sin. So basically the disciples were thinking this man was a sinner or his parents were sinners, and that's the reason why he was born blind. They had a terrible misconception about the character of God. Let's go to question number two. According to Jesus, why was this man born blind? So let's find out the answer that Jesus gave to the disciples. Was it because his parents or he had sinned? Obviously not. Here is the answer, John chapter 9 and verse 3. Jesus said, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. This is very interesting. Jesus was saying, you know, this man didn't sin, his parents didn't sin. This man was born for this particular moment. Let's notice uh, what we find here in the middle of page 296, the note. These words of Jesus leave us with a distinct impression that the man was born blind specifically to meet Jesus at this particular moment. That is to say, the Father had incorporated this event into the itinerary of Jesus before the blind man was even born. And you know, in a previous lesson, I read a statement from Desire of Ages where Ellen White stated that before Jesus came to this earth, he and his father sat down and they went over his entire ministry while he would be here on earth. So this event appears to have been planned in eternity past. The man was to meet Jesus at this particular moment because Jesus says but that the works of God should be made manifest in him now let's go to question number three what did Jesus mean by day and night in the expression I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day the night cometh when no man can work what did Jesus mean when he said that this is John chapter 9 and verse 4. Well, Ellen White has a very interesting quotation. It's found in Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 191 
uh, where uh, she gives us an inkling of what this, um, uh, what this verse means when Jesus says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. When is the day and when is the night? Well, notice this statement. Ellen White wrote, Letters have come to me asking me if I have any special light as to the time when probation will close. That's important. And I answer that I have only this message to bear, that it is now time to work while the day lasts, for the night cometh in which no man can work. Clearly, Ellen White understood the day as the period of probation. And she understood the night when no man can work as the moment when probation closes. And after this, all cases are decided for life or for death. In fact, let's read the note. While it is day, probation's door is still open. But when the night comes, probation has closed. In its immediate historical context, the day here refers to the ministry of Jesus. The door was still open for the Jewish nation. The night when no man can work is a reference to the closing of probation's door for the Jewish nation for rejecting the Messiah. And so this has a literal historical application to the Jewish nation. The day is the ministry of Christ when he's reaching out to the Jewish nation so that they would accept him the night is the time when probation closes for the nation. And of course, now the gospel will go to the Gentiles. Let's go to question number four at the bottom of page 296. How did the Apostle Paul metaphorically employ the words day and night? Now we're going to find that the Apostle Paul also uses the words day and night in a similar way to Jesus. Here is the answer. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 Verses 4 and 5. The Apostle Paul wrote, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. So notice night is compared to darkness. So the Apostle Paul is saying, Believers are people of the day, whereas unbelievers are people of the night. What did the Apostle Paul mean by what we find in 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 and 5? The note explains at the top of page 297. Clearly, the Apostle Paul uses the words day and night in the same sense as Jesus did. But whereas Jesus was speaking about the closing of probation's door, for the Jewish nation, Paul was speaking about the closing of the door of probation for the world. This seems to indicate that the story of the blind, blind man's healing has a broader meaning than its immediate historical setting. So what uh, Jesus is saying is, the day is a period of my ministry, I'm trying to reach out to the Jewish nation. The night is when probation closes for the Jewish nation when no man can work. But the Apostle Paul broadens this and he says the day is the period of probation for the world. The night that comes is when probation closes and all cases have been decided for life or for death. Now at the top of page 297 we will now go to the next subtitle, A Sabbath Conflict. Number one. In the Pharisees' estimation, what sin did Jesus commit by healing the blind man? John chapter 9 and verse 16 tells us what sin they conceived that Jesus had uh, committed. It reads like this, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath. Let's go to question number two. What did Jesus do on the Sabbath to exacerbate the anger of the Pharisees. So we're going to notice that, God, that Jesus did this on the Sabbath day, but Jesus did more than just heal this man. Notice the actions that Jesus performed 
that particularly incensed or angered the religious leaders against the Lord Jesus. We're told in John chapter 9 and verse 6 what the actions of Jesus were. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. So what did Jesus do on the Sabbath to exacerbate the anger of the Pharisees? He spat on the ground, made clay of the spittle, and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now, why did Jesus do this? And what was so serious about this? Let's read the note. Actually, Jesus broke several rabbinical rules that were believed to be violations of the Sabbath. Among these were the following, healing on the Sabbath, spitting on the Sabbath, making clay on the Sabbath, and telling the man to wash in the pool of Siloam on the Sabbath. Jesus could have instantaneously healed this man, but he chose a different approach. Was Jesus identifying himself as the creator when he healed this man? When Jesus created man, he made him out of clay, according to Isaiah 64 and verse 8. And now Jesus recreated a man's eyesight by creating or by using clay as well. So Jesus had broken a series of rabbinical rules in the minds of the religious leaders. Now let's go to this thought question, number three. Why do you think Jesus did not heal this man outright, but rather told him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam? Would the man have been healed if he had not obeyed the command of Jesus? So the question is, Jesus could have healed him and said, you know, your eyes are open, go. But Jesus actually told him to go wash himself wash his face at least in the pool of Siloam. Why did Jesus do this? Because Jesus wanted to make a point. The man had to obey the word of Jesus just like the paralytic had to pick up his bed and walk. In other words, both the blind man and the paralytic had to exercise faith in order to experience healing. And faith, of course, is shown by obedience. Let's read the note under question number three. The Sabbath healings of Jesus were never, as far as we know, life and death cases. In other words, people were not on their deathbed when Jesus healed them. If the lives of those he healed had been in danger, the rabbis would not have quarreled with him because rabbinical law allowed healing on the Sabbath in emergency cases. The question then remains, if Jesus could have waited until the Sabbath was over to perform his works of healing, why did he insist on performing them on the Sabbath? The answer is that Jesus wished to underline the importance of genuine Sabbath observance in contrast to the counterfeit Sabbath which was based on rabbinical tradition. So Jesus was attempting to make a point. He was saying the laws that the rabbis have added to the Sabbath are not part and parcel of the Sabbath. It's a counterfeit Sabbath because it is a Sabbath created by them. Now let's go to question number four at the bottom of page 297. Did Jesus ever break the Sabbath as he was accused by the Pharisees? Remember that in John chapter 9, verse 16, the Jewish leaders accused Jesus of breaking the Sabbath. So were they right that Jesus had broken the Sabbath? The fact is that Jesus did not ever break the Sabbath. You say, how do we know that? Well, healing on Sabbath is not forbidden by the Bible. The Pharisees had created this tradition that it was wrong to heal someone on Sabbath, someone who had a chronic disease who was not an emergency case. Let's notice a parallel passage to the one in John chapter 9. And this parallel passage, actually it's a verse, Matthew chapter 12 and verse 12. The question once again is, 
did Jesus ever break the Sabbath as he was accused by the Pharisees? Here is the answer. Jesus is speaking, Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Notice Jesus isn't saying it's breaking the Sabbath to do well on the Sabbath day, to heal on the Sabbath day. No, Jesus is saying it's lawful. It's in harmony with the law to heal on the Sabbath. So if it's in harmony with the law to heal on Sabbath, Jesus was lawful in what he did. He did not break the Sabbath day. Let's read the note at the bottom of page 297. Some religious leaders today claim that Jesus exercised his messianic authority and broke the Sabbath. If this were true, then the Pharisees were right. So you would be taking the side of the Pharisees versus Jesus. Jesus did not employ his messianic authority to break the Sabbath but rather to define its proper observance. Only the Lord of the Sabbath is authorized to explain how to properly keep the Sabbath. That's why Jesus said in Mark chapter 2, He said the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath, because Jesus created it. And if Jesus created the Sabbath, it means that he would be the best person to define how the Sabbath is supposed to be kept. Now let's go to number five at the top of page 298. When some Pharisees affirmed that Jesus could not be of God because he broke the Sabbath, what did others reply? Let's notice John chapter 9 and verse 16. John chapter 9 and verse 16. Remember the question is, when some Pharisees affirmed that Jesus could not be of God because he broke the Sabbath, what did others reply? It says there, how can this man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was division among them. So notice they're asking, if he was a sinner, how could he perform these miracles? See, once again, they're saying that Jesus did not sin by breaking the Sabbath. The general populace disagreed with the Pharisees. The Pharisees said he broke the Sabbath, so he's a sinner. But the multitude say, how can someone heal like this if he really is a sinner? So basically, the multitudes got the point. Jesus was not breaking the Sabbath. Jesus was not sinning. Uh, actually, this caused division among them. Now let's read the note at the top of page 298. The crass hypocrisy of the Pharisees can be clearly seen in the fact that they sought to kill Jesus on the Sabbath. This is interesting. You know, they accused Jesus of breaking the Sabbath for Jesus healing someone on the Sabbath. And here, John 9 is telling us that they are plotting to kill Jesus on the Sabbath. So in their mind, it's, okay, it's wrong to heal on the Sabbath, but it would be okay to plan to kill on the Sabbath. Let's notice how this continues. The crass hypocrisy of the Pharisees can be clearly seen in the fact that they sought to kill Jesus on the Sabbath while Jesus brought healing. The greatest conflicts of Jesus with the religious leaders of his day had to do with the proper manner of keeping the Sabbath. In the days of Christ, the religious leaders kept the right day. This is very important. The religious leaders kept the right day, but it was a counterfeit Sabbath because it was loaded down with the traditions of men. Now let's compare that with what's going to happen at the end of time. At the end of time, the greatest conflicts of God's people with the world's religious leaders will likewise involve Sabbath observance. But whereas the Pharisees kept the Sabbath on the right day but in the wrong way, the religious world at the end will keep the wrong day. So basically, the Sabbath was the, the greatest point of contention in the days of Christ. It will be at the end. But the difference is that in the days of Christ, the Pharisees kept the, wrong, the right day, 
but they kept it in the wrong way. At the end of time, what is going to happen is that people are going to keep the wrong day. Now let's go to our next section, seeking excuses to disbelieve. Question number one, middle of page 298. When the Pharisees asked this man who had healed him, what did he reply? John 9, verse 15. This man, speaking about Jesus, says, He put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed, and I do see. Question number two. What did the blind man reply when the Pharisees asked him what he thought about Jesus? And, of course, he answers in John chapter 9 and verse 17, what sayest, uh, they're asking him, what sayest thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? The man re replies, he is a prophet. So this man, you know, his conception of Jesus, even though he hasn't seen Jesus yet, is that Jesus is a great prophet. And we're going to notice that his consciousness of Jesus is going to grow as the story progresses. At first, he thinks he's a prophet. At the very end, he accepts Jesus as the Messiah. Let's go to number three. When the Pharisees refused to believe that this man had been born blind, to whom did they turn for corroboration? So the man says, you know, I was blind and now I see. I believe he's a prophet. So now the Pharisees say, now nah, we need to get a second opinion about this. Let's go check with his parents to see if his parents can corroborate this man's story. Notice John chapter 9, verses 18 and 19. They called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son, who ye say was born blind? Is this really your son? How then doth he now see, they say. Notice number four. How did the parents reply to the Pharisees' question? Here's the answer, John 9, verses 20 and 21. The parents stated, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age. Ask him, he shall speak for himself. So his parents say, we know two things for certain. He's our son, and we know that he was born blind. What we don't know is how he now sees. And if you really want to know how he sees, go ask him. He's the one that was healed. Now let's go to question number five at the bottom of page 298. What high-handed methods did the Pharisees employ with those who confessed their faith in Jesus? In other words, anybody who confessed their faith in Jesus, the Pharisees used high-handed methods to intimidate them into lining up with their religion based on tradition. Here's the answer. These words spake his parents, in other words, they say, ask him, because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. In other words, they said, if anyone believes in Jesus, that person is going to be expelled from the synagogue, which would be the equivalent to the church today. Uh, in other words, they would be excommunicated, or as uh, we speak in Seventh-day Adventist circles, he would be disfellowshipped from the church. Now we go to the top of page 299. Number six. How did the religious leaders seek to bias this man against Jesus? John chapter 9 and verse 24. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. So they're saying to this man, you know, you praise God. Don't praise this man. Praise God. Because we know that this man is a sinner. Number seven, how did the blind man reply to the accusations of the Pharisees against Jesus? 
The answer is found in John chapter 9 and verse 25. I have told you already, and ye did not hear. Wherefore should ye hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? In other words, he's saying, I already told you how my eyes were healed. Uh, you know, why do you ask me again? Is it because you want to be the disciples of Jesus as well? Now, let's read the note, which is very important. Remarkably, this man claimed to be Christ's disciple even though he had not yet met him. You say, how do we know that? Because the man said, will you also be his disciples? So in other words, he's saying, I'm his disciple, so do you want to know who opened my eyes so that you can be his disciple as well? So he hadn't even met Jesus, and he was already a disciple of Jesus. Let's go to number 9, middle of page 299. Whose disciples did the Pharisees claim to be? John 9, 28 and 29 tells us uh, that the religious leaders responded to this man, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. In other words, we know who Moses was. We're the disciples of Moses. If you want to be this man's disciples whom we don't know where he comes from, fine by us. But we are the disciples of Moses. Now this takes us to question number 10. Were the Pharisees truly Moses' disciples? Were they really followers of Moses? Well, let's notice the answer in John 5, verses 45 through 47. Uh, this is in uh, uh, a very important chapter uh, in the Gospel of John. Jesus mentioned to them, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. In other words, Moses accuses you. I don't need to accuse you. Moses does. What did he mean? Jesus stated, For had ye believed Moses ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? So Jesus is saying, you claim to be the, the disciples of Moses, you are not the disciples of Moses, because Moses wrote about me. Moses was my disciple, and yet you reject me. So how can you say that you are the disciples of Moses when you reject me, of whom Moses wrote. Let's go to number 11. What powerful Bible lesson did this man give the Pharisees? This blind man uh, taught the Pharisees a tremendous lesson. What was it? John 9, verses 30 to 32. Why herein is a marvelous thing that ye know not from whence he is. In other words, it's, it's incredible that you don't know where he's from. And yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God, and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? So he's saying, you know, it's amazing to me that you don't know where this man comes from. God doesn't hear sinners. God hears the sins of those, uh, the, the prayers of those who are righteous. So how is it that this man was able to heal me? Since the world began, he says, there's not a single case of an individual who was born blind being healed of his blindness. Let's read the note. The statement of the blind man was literally true. In the Old Testament, the opening of the eyes of the blind was reserved for the Messianic age. You can read Isaiah 35, for example. When Jesus opened up the eyes of this blind man, the Pharisees should have seen in Jesus the fulfillment of these Messianic prophecies. 
there were messianic prophecies like I mentioned Isaiah 35 and verse 5 that said that when the Messiah came he would open the eyes of the blind. Here Jesus had opened the eyes of this man who was born blind and yet they did not recognize that Jesus was the predicted Messiah of Isaiah 35 as well as uh, you know Luke chapter 4 verse 18 which is a quotation of Isaiah chapter 61. Let's go to question number 12 at the bottom of page 299. What did the Pharisees do when this man confessed Jesus? See this man openly, he hadn't seen Jesus yet, but this man openly now confesses Jesus. What did the Pharisees do? They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins. Of course they're saying that because he's, he was born blind, so they say he's blind because he was a great sinner, God is punishing him. So they say, Thou wast altogether born in sins. And thus thou teachest us, and they cast him out. In other words, they cast him now out of the synagogue. Let's read the note at the top of page 300. In today's language, we would say that the Pharisees excommunicated or disfellowshipped this man. The Pharisees could not match his logic, so they strong-armed him out of the synagogue. So in other words, because they can't actually reason with him and they can't by argument win they have to use force and they expel him from the synagogue. Incidentally this is going to happen all over again at the end of time. At the end of time uh, peop, uh, the religious leaders are not going to be able to answer the arguments of those who keep the Sabbath because the Bible is absolutely clear on the issue of the Sabbath. So what they're going to do is they're going to try and use force against God's people because they cannot answer by argument. Okay, let's go now, page 300, uh, to question number one. The subtitle is, The Man Encounters Jesus. Number one, when the blind man first saw Jesus, what remark did he make to show that he had grown in his understanding of who Jesus was? So now when he actually meets Jesus, we're going to see that he's grown in understanding who Jesus really was. Uh, John chapter 9, verses 35 to 38, Jesus asks him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And his answer is this, And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Of course, this man had asked before, Who is he that I might believe in him? And Jesus has said, It is me. So this man actually believed in Jesus, trusted in Jesus, accepted Jesus as the Messiah. Let's read the note. The blind man had grown in his understanding of Jesus. At first he thought that Jesus was a prophet, but by the end of the story he was convinced that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. In other words, he had been physically blind, now his eyes are opened. And he not only, not only sees physically, but spiritually his eyesight has been awakened because he has discovered the Messiah. Let's go to question number two, page 300. What cryptic statement did Jesus make after the blind man confessed him as the Messiah? Jesus stated these words, For judgment I am come into this world that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. Now that's kind of strange language. Jesus says, I came into the world so that those who do not see can see, and that those who see can be made blind. What did Jesus mean when he said this? Well, as we go along, we're going to find the answer. Let's go to number three. Middle of page 300. When Jesus spoke the words of John 9, 39, what did the Pharisees perceive? And that is when Jesus said, I have come into this world that they which don't see might see, and those who claim to see may be made blind. Uh, what did the Pharisees perceive? Here's the answer in John 9, 40 and 41. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, are we blind also? 
So they're asking, you know, we claim to see. Are you saying that we who claim to see are blind? Jesus gives an answer. Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see, therefore your sin remaineth. Jesus saying, You are not blind. You've seen my works. You've heard my words. You've seen me open the eyes of the blind, a messianic prophecy. You see all the works of the Messiah. You claim to see, but actually, instead of seeing, you are blind. Jesus is saying, if you did not know that I am the Messiah, you would have no sin. But because you reject me with full light that I am the Messiah, you are blind. Let's go to the next section. The subtitle is Willful Blindness. Number one. Reflect on John 9, 39. In the light of Matthew 13, 13 through 15, Mark 4, 12, Mark 8, 18, Luke 8, 10, Isaiah 6, verse 10. Uh, we don't have time to read all of these verses, but in these verses, Jesus says some very interesting things. Uh, actually, the idea that uh, he came to make blind those who claim to see and to give eyesight to those who are blind uh, is the content of the verses that I just mentioned. So I would encourage you to look up these references and uh, answer the question, in the light of these verses, what did Jesus mean by his statement? Okay, let's go to question number two. According to the Bible, is there a link between physical and spiritual eyesight? Probably where we should go, first of all, is in Genesis chapter 3. And this is the original temptation of Satan to Eve. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 5, uh, the serpent, Satan, states to Eve, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, that is of the fruit, your eyes will be opened. Now obviously this is not talking about uh, physical blindness. Eve was not physically blind. The serpent is telling her, your eyes will be opened. That means the eyes of her understanding. You're going to understand, you're going to know something that you didn't know before. In other words, God wants you to be spiritually blind. There's something that He's trying to hide from you. So let's notice once again number two. According to the Bible, is there a link between physical and spiritual eyesight? Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18 says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. So notice the eyes, spiritually speaking, represent the understanding. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of this calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. So you'll notice here that the eyes represent the understanding. It represents perception, in other words, spiritually speaking. Let's read the note. In the Bible, physical eyesight is used as a metaphor to describe those who have spiritual discernment. And, uh, you know, you can, uh, we also, we noticed Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 18, and now we're going to notice several other verses as well. Let's go to question number three at the bottom of page 300. What did David ask the Lord? Psalm 119, verse 18. Obviously, David had good eyesight, physically speaking. But David is going to pray to the Lord the following words. Open thou my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. So he's saying, give me spiritual understanding. Help me to see the beauty and the breadth of your holy law. So once again, the idea is that eyesight, physically speaking, represents spiritual discernment. The Pharisees claim to see but they were blind because they did not have the spiritual discernment to behold that Jesus was the Messiah. Though they claimed to see, they were blind. Whereas this man who was physically blind, his understanding was opened, and now he spiritually saw that Jesus was the Messiah. Let's read the note at the top of page 301. The Pharisees thought they knew much about the law, yet because they failed to see Jesus in the law, 
their rigorous casuistry became a farce. Only the Holy Spirit can reveal the limitless depths of God's spiritual law. Let's go to number four. What did God do to Israel when they apostatized from Him? Well, Isaiah 29, verse 10. Now we're talking about the spiritual dimension of eyesight. Notice what happened. When Israel apostatized from God, when they forsook God, uh, we're told something very interesting about the eyes. Notice Isaiah 29, verse 10. For the Lord has poured out upon you, that is upon Israel, the spirit of deep sleep, and has closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. The seers are the prophets. So in other words, when Israel apostatized, there were no prophets in Israel, and therefore the people walked around blind. So basically, to see spiritually means to have a prophet in the myth, midst and to follow the, the, the understanding and the spiritual eyesight that the prophet provides. Let's go to number five. What great commission did God give Saul of Tarsus upon his conversion? So when Saul of Tarsus was converted, what mission did God give to him? Uh, we find here in uh, Acts 26 and verse 18 the following words, speaking about the mission of Saul of Tarsus. To open their eyes, that is the eyes of the Gentiles. So Saul of Tarsus was going to preach to the Gentiles and he was going to open their eyes. Obviously, it's not talking about physical eyes. It's talking about their understanding. They're receiving Jesus as the Messiah by the preaching of the Word of God. So to open the Gentiles' eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, because a person who is blind is in darkness. But when they see Jesus, now their eyes are enlightened and they see the light. So to open the eyes of the Gentiles and turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan, who is the prince of darkness, by the way, unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Number six, at the middle of page 301. According to the Apostle Paul, is God responsible for his people's hardness of heart? In other words, is God responsible because his very own people who claim his name are Hard of heart? Here's the answer. Acts 28, 26, and 27. Saying, go on to this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand. So they heard the words of Jesus, but they didn't understand. And seeing ye shall see and not perceive. They were seeing the works of Jesus, but they didn't perceive that he was the Messiah. And then we find these words. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ill ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes, eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. So notice that God is not responsible for shutting the eyes, because the text says, For the heart of this people is waxed gross, their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Let's go to question number seven. Middle of page 301. Does God bring calamities upon people, and harden their hearts, and close their eyes, in other words, does God uh, do this with some people? He says, I'm going to harden their hearts and I'm going to close their eyes so that they're not able to discern the Messiah and be saved. Of course, if God did this, he would be responsible for the loss of people. So how do we understand this? No, God does not bring calamities upon people. God does not harden the hearts of people or close their eyes. The people do this. When people reject the Lord... He withdraws His presence and leaves them to the mercy of the master that they have chosen. And you have Pharaoh as a prime example. We're told in the book of Exodus that Pharaoh, that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. There are other verses in Exodus that say that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. 
You know, it's kind of like the sun. When the sun shines upon ice, it melts the ice. When the sun shines upon clay, it hardens the clay. The sun is the same, but that which it shines upon determines whether melting or hardening takes place. The light of truth of Jesus shone upon the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders. God wanted His message, Jesus wanted His message to soften their hearts, but instead they hardened their hearts. Let's go to question number 8, page 301. What did Jesus say about the Pharisees? This is Matthew 23, verses 16 and 17, and also verse 19, verse 24, and verse 26. Uh, Jesus said, Woe unto you, ye blind guides. A little bit later on, he says, Ye fools and blind. A little later on, he says, Thou blind Pharisee. So the Pharisees were blind because they claimed to have great truth. They claimed to see, but they rejected the Messiah. Therefore, they were spiritually blind. Let's go to question number nine. What counsel did Jesus give his disciples in view of the blindness of the Pharisees? Jesus told his disciples to do something very important. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. So Jesus said to the disciples, don't follow those leaders. They're blind. If you follow them and they go off a cliff, you're going to go off the cliff with them. In other words, they're going to be lost and you're going to be lost as well. Let's go to question number 10. Very bottom of page 301. What did Jesus say about those who hate their brothers? Now we get into a more personal application to us. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 11, we find the beloved disciple writing, But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. So in other words, if an individual hates his brother, that person is walking around in darkness and is spiritually blind, even though that person may claim to be a Christian, even though that person might claim to follow Jesus, that person is in darkness. That person is spiritually blind. The Pharisees hated Jesus, and therefore they were blind. Well, we have two more questions on page 302 to conclude this lesson. Is there any chance that the Laodicean church, this is the last church of the seven in Revelation. Remember, they represent seven periods of church history. Uh, you know, the first church, Ephesus, would be the apostolic church. Laodicea is the seventh church. It would represent the end time church. So the question is, is there any chance that the Laodicean church could commit the same mistake as the Pharisees. You might say, God forbid that that could happen. But it is possible. Notice Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17. This is what Laodicea says. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and now notice, and blind and naked. So notice, God looks at Laodicea differently than she sees herself. She sees herself as rich and increased with goods and in need of absolutely nothing. Jesus looks at Laodicea, his end time church, and he says, you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So the last day church can commit the same mistake that was made by the church in the days of Christ. Let's go to our last question, question number 12. Study the story of the men on the road to Emmaus. Now, let me just go through this story very briefly. I have the day of the resurrection, actually the late in the afternoon, two disciples or followers of Jesus, they're not members of the 12, but they're followers of Jesus. 
uh, are walking to a little town called Emmaus. And as they're walking, Jesus catches up to them and uh, starts talking with them. He says, what are you discussing? And they said to him, are you the only person who hasn't heard about what's happened in Jerusalem this weekend? How we thought that uh, uh, Jesus was the Messiah who was going to redeem Israel and today is the third day since they killed him. Haven't you ever, uh, haven't you heard of that? And then Jesus uh, told them that, uh, that he was the Messiah and he did so by beginning at Moses and all of the prophets. He showed them in all of the scriptures the things concerning himself. We find in Luke chapter 24 and verse 16 uh, the following words. But their eyes were holden. In other words, their eyes were shut. This is before they recognize Jesus, that Jesus has resurrected from the dead. But their eyes were holden. That is, uh, they, they, they were blinded in a certain sense, that they should not know him. And then we go to verse 31. Uh, and their eyes were opened. See, at first their eyes are closed. They don't recognize Jesus. Then, a little bit later on, we are told that their eyes are open. It's not talking about physical eyes because they obviously could see very well. But their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. And so we have this experience of the, of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. You know, when they, when they think that Jesus has died, he's not going to redeem Israel, they're blind. But when they see that Jesus has resurrected, now they see. They recognize Jesus is the Messiah. How did we miss the idea that Jesus was going to resurrect from the dead if the scriptures are so clear on that point? So basically, their eyes were opened and they recognized the Messiah in the scriptures. While on their other hand, the Pharisees, in spite of all of the evidence that they had in the teachings of Jesus and in the actions, the miracles of Jesus, they tried to hide the truth of the resurrection. And so we find in this lesson that those who open their minds and their hearts to receive Jesus, their eyes of understanding are opened. Whereas those who have great light, who have great revelation of Jesus, but reject Jesus as Savior and Lord, the Bible speaks of them as being spiritually blind. So I hope that this lesson has been useful and that we will apply the lessons of this particular class to our own personal experience, that we might receive Jesus as our Savior and Lord, and in this way, our eyes can be wide open unto salvation.